So here we are, designed for 3D printing tips, tricks, and techniques. First of all, we want to build on these some basic concepts here uh, before we start just designing parts. There's a few things we have to understand. We need to know our uh, machine capabilities. We need to know our design considerations. Uh, we need to know about sporting data. And we actually have to do some part printing. So we'll be looking at these aspects uh, to do an overall design. It doesn't do any good to do a design if you don't know what you're really going to print it on first. So we want to look at machine capabilities. We want to look a little bit at the technologies, the material differences, and the abilities or limitations of each machine. Now, these are important because it really helps you understand your design and what you can and cannot get away with. So we want to look at each of these three things under just machine capabilities. First thing we want to look at is just the technologies. Hopefully many of you are already familiar with 3D printing out there, and there's literally thousands of 3D printers available today. And the big question always comes up, why are there so many 3D printers? And here you can see a picture. These are just a few. This, these are not even all of them. These are just a subset of what Stratasys offers out there for 3D printers. We are at Stratasys reseller. But to answer why there are so many, we need to understand that each 3D printer has different capabilities. Each printer has different materials. And on your design, each part has different applications. And each part has different geometries. So. This is why you have to look at the printer first as you're looking at your application, your geometry, things like that. If you look at fused deposition modeling, this is where Stratus has started out, is fused deposition modeling. And it's actually um, taking a filament line and melting it and extruding it uh, to build your three-dimensional part. You have a model spool, and you have a support spool on there. The support spool is made out of a different material. This aids enormously with trying to get your parts uh, separated from the supports. Many cheaper FDM machines out there will have one material, and then it's very difficult to separate what's part and what is support. If you look at the PolyJet technology, this is an inkjet printer. It works very much just like your inkjet print head at home. The only difference is you have a z-axis that as you print and drop your uh, material, you can build it layer upon layer in there. And it uses a UV light to cure the material. So it's actually a UV ink. It's a photopolymer, but it's a UV ink, if you'll think of it that way. And the UV light is curing it layer by layer, and as every time it goes across the print, the UV light uh, will um, cure it. So let's look a little bit at material differences between the those two technologies. And these are not all the technologies out there. There are many others. But a couple of differences on the material uh, differences for these two technologies is that FDM uses engineered plastics. These are thermoplastics. They can uh, be recycled, let's say. And I've got an example down there. If you look at a chocolate bar, you can take a chocolate bar, you can melt it, you can reshape it, you can melt it, you can reshape it, you can go back and forth with it. But the polyjet is a photopolymer. And the photopolymer is a thermoset material. Once it is kicked off, it's like a, it's like a hardener with a catalyst in there, uh, JB Weld or Bondo for putty uh, for your car. It's, it, once it's hardened, it can never go back to its original form. So think of it like a flour being made into a cracker, and it can never be, even though it can be crushed up pretty fine, it can never really go back to flour. So it can't be separated. This is a, um, a good thing in the sense that you can do quite a bit of things with it as far as injection molding plastic into thermosets and not have to worry about them melting back to liquid. So it does give you a good application set around the photopolymers. And then if you look at just the FDM, these are just the thermoplastics, uh, you've got a wide range of materials, everything from ABS. ASA is similar to ABS with a um, UV resistance. 
You've got a PLA, that's a, a plant-based uh, material that's very uh, cheap and uh, very easy to produce. Then, of course, you can go up to your polycarbonates, uh, nylons. We have Altim and Terra's our newest PEC material uh, that's very high strength, PPSF, and we have a carbon field nylon also. We even have a specialty material, that ST-130 is sacrificial tooling. So if you were to make a part out of this uh, ST-130 and then wrap it in fiberglass, you could actually just take it and soak out the material and have a fiberglass part. So it's got a lot of uh, good capabilities, well-rounded group in there for uh, general engineering performance materials. Polyjet materials, remember these are all thermosets. Once they're cured, they will not go back to a liquid form. So these are liquid like an ink. They shoot out to your printhead. You've got the Vero family, and they come in different colors. You've got the Vero white, Vero yellow, red, blue, all these colors. Uh, and they've got some new vivid colors. We have the uh, 720, which is a clear. We have the Rigor, Durus materials. Those are a little harder, a little more impact resistant. The uh, flexible materials. The Agilus is the newest one out there. It's wonderful. It's got a lot of uh, flexibility to it, a lot of stretch to it even. The uh, engineering materials, we can do a digital ABS. We have a high temp. And then, of course, we have some specialty materials out there for hearing aids, uh, dental materials, biocompatible. The Veroflex is really uh, designed for eyeglass application where they're actually making eyeglasses with the material. The frames, not the lenses, I should say. So once we look at the materials, and now we want to look at some of the abilities or limitations. And this is really where our design makes the difference for us, knowing what our machine can do, knowing what our machine cannot do. So we can design around that uh, for our parts. When you look at FDM, you're going to be limited to layer sizes. Typically, you can do 5, 7, 10, 13 sliced layers. Uh, these layers that are extruded down, they, de they are dependent on the machine you get and the material. For example, your ABS material, I can do 5, 7, 10, and 13 thousandths. However, if you're working with Altim, you're going to be limited to 10 and 13 thousandths layers. So it does make a difference, but these are the typical um, layer slices for FDM. So you look at FDM, 5, 7, 10, 13, polyjet, 16 micron. So it's very, very fine detail, 28 micron, 30, 36 micron. Again, that's dependent on the machine and the material. So we want to look at some of the restrictions we have out there. Let's look at minimum wall thickness. It's an, it's an obvious question, how small the part, how small the detail can I design and get on um, polyjet because the it's a print head and we're doing 16, 600, 600 by 1600 DPI you can get very fine droplets however you can make very thin walls I've made as small as five thousandths of an inch but they're so delicate they are fragile in the handling of them and even in the cleaning operation so you can do those, but just remember they're going to be tougher to handle. Now in the FDM, uh, fused deposition modeling, we are drawing extrusions and we're drawing them uh, with a tool path. Think of this tool path just like a CNC, a computer numerical control machine uh, tool path that would use an end mill or something like that to machine uh, typical uh, subtractive manufacturing. But each contour is generally about two times the layer thickness. So your vertical walls need to have two contours for strength. So it'll look something like this. So you'll want to draw a couple of um, contours to give yourself strength. Therefore, if you're doing a 5 thousandths layer, you would typically have a 20 thousandths wall that you would be limited to. If you're building in 10 thousandths layers, which is uh, generally the most uh, built out there, 
it's about a 40 thousandths wall that you would like to design around on there. So your and your horizontal that's, that's vertical walls. Now your horizontal walls should be at least two layers thick. So you'll end up with uh, if you're doing 10 thousandths, that would be 20 thousandths thick for your horizontal, and then for your vertical, you'd have a 40 thousandths wall. Now that is a, a limitation. A minimum, there are exceptions where you can go a little smaller. There's also some tricks in here that you can use to make thinner walls. Here's a part that's got some heat sink fins on it. It's actually 30 thousandths thick, and you'll have difficulty building that in 10 thousandths layers. But if we position that on a 45 degree angle and we slice that up, you can see the slices on the right hand side. Those slices now become wider. They now become 42 thousandths wide, and I can build this, and I have built this on, on an angle so that I can build those thin fins at 30 thousandths. But here again, the sign of 45 for those of you who really like, who really like trig in high school. I know there's a lot of you out there that really liked it. So 40, the sign of 45 makes it almost one and a half times larger. So a nice trick there to get some thinner walls sometimes. Then we want to talk about self-supporting angles. So we want to ask, what is the largest angle I can build without supports? Or in other words, how far can layers extend before they fall? And you can see in the graphics here, you can build just a little bit out, and if you build too far out, it's going to fall without some kind of a, a structure or what we call a support underneath that layer. So the, when the question came up, what's the largest angle I can build? I designed a little part here to look at. It went from 20 degree angle all the way to 65 degree angle. And I decided to build this part with no supports. I just manually edited out the supports and built this part to see what I could build. I was really surprised that it didn't crash on me altogether, but I could see at 20 degrees, it was kind of ragged in there. Uh, on, a, on 10 thousand slayers. But if I built it at 7 thousand slayers, because, because I've got uh, smaller layers, they don't extend out as far, therefore I can actually build a little bit better. However, uh, 45 degrees is about the maximum you want to go without supports. The, the standard default for FDM is set at 43. You can go as low as 40 degrees and still have a good surface finish, but not much further than that. Also be aware that it does make a difference on the material you're using. If you're using, these are ABS materials, but if you're using something like Ultim that's a much higher heat, uh, you're, you're, it could droop a lot earlier on you than 45 degrees. So for that reason, you really need to run a test part and if you want these test parts, they're available. But you need to run a test part out there so that you'll know what expectation you're going to get from your machine. So when you look at supports for uh, holes and radii, we know that we can build holes in a vertical position laying down. But what about holes standing up on the side? Because when you're designing parts, you're going to have holes uh, going in every direction. So the question is, how can I build these? How far can I build these holes? When you think about that hole, it's really just a series of angles going around until it closes up at the top. So we know how far we can build with an angle. So how far can I get away with the holes? So I built this part, and it was uh, sitting up with no support in it. And you can see the 1 8 inch hole built fine with no supports in there, quarter inch. Uh, it was questionable. I would have to ream that out with a drill or a reamer. Uh, but after I get to 3 8 of an inch, half an inch, I'm going to want some support in there. It's going to collapse. Now, that depends. If you're just using this to run some wiring or cabling through, you may not care. You may not want to spend the time uh, taking the supports out of your material. Therefore, you could get away with an inch and still build an inch up without that. So that's support, uh, the angles and the support holes uh, and supports with FDM. Now when you look at polyjet, it's a little bit different. Because you're dropping 
droplets from a head. All surfaces must be supported. Remember, these are just droplets uh, on each layer coming out of your inkjet head. Therefore, uh, it's kind of the law of gravity. Isaac Newton limited us on that one, so every droplet has to be supported. Newton made it a law. Um, fine detail. For your FDM, remember your different layers have different contour or road widths in there. Therefore, your lettering is going to be uh, defined on how small you can get that road width in there. For polyjet, 1600 dpi, lettering is not a problem. You can do uh, uh, almost any small lettering. And we're going to talk a little bit more about lettering here later on, but this is for fine detail. One of the things I want to point out on the machines, uh, and this goes for any 3D printing machine, is there's a, a sharp edge error, I call it. A lot of people think it's accuracy error. I've run into this problem personally, thinking that I had a problem with accuracy on the machine and found out it's not the accuracy of the machine, but the geometry of what we're building. When I worked in aerospace and built leading edge wings, I could never get that sharp point on there because what's happening is this is a simple four inch part with a five degree angle. You can see the green line is my tool path and the red out on the end there circled is my actual geometry. So my tool path, if I blew that up, is actually stopping short before I reach the CAD geometry. So how short is it actually drawing? Again, if you really like, if you really, really like trig, most people don't, uh, there's your formula for it. And you would see that uh, at 20 thousandths, if I was building 10 thousandths layers, I'd have a 20 thousandths road width there. And 20 thousandths, I would end up 218 thousandths short. That's a lot. That's almost a quarter of an inch. It's 764 fourths. But if you don't like trig, you can model this out in CAD and get the same dimension, 0.219. So if I have my drawing diameter at 20 thousandths, and I'm trying to go to a sharp edge, I got a problem. And when you see that much error, people immediately assume it's accuracy, and it's not. It's actually geometry. So keep that in mind. Now let's talk about how we can overcome this. When you're designing your part, you can easily overcome this just by modifying your CAD. If you know it's going to be a 20 thousandths uh, 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 drawing diameter or extrusion that you're extruding, just extend it out 20 thousandths out there. Here you can see it extended out 20 thousandths. It's going to draw all the way to the tip with that, and it's going to have a 20 thousandths lip. Now, if you need a sharp leading edge, at least now you have material that you can go and sand it in to get that sharp knife edge that you truly want for your geometry. But if it's within 20 thousandths and that's okay for you, that works well. So again, this just pertains to, it doesn't matter if you're using stereolithography, it doesn't matter if you're using uh, laser centering, all materials and lasers or whatever have some predetermined diameter that they're going to draw at. And if you're using SLA with 10 thousandths, you're going to be 128 thousandths short. I've, I've done this. I've, I've done too many years. So just to let you know, it pertains to all 3D printing, not just uh, uh, Stratasys products. Some, some software out there will offer a filter, and the filter says, uh, setting says that if it's too small to draw, go ahead and draw it anyway so that it won't be lost. So here you are. It draws it for you. It's actually a little larger than your CAD. It actually goes down at a little more of an angle, but it will draw the full length. And instead of one line that we had on the extended, you're actually drawing two lines down there. So you're going to be about 40 thousandths thick. Again, uh, you can sand it in but you don't have to do any special CAD modeling. You just tell it to filter it. And that is a setting in our uh, advanced software, uh, which is the Insight software on our um, larger Stratasys machines. 
So once we looked at some of the machine capabilities, now we want to look at some design considerations and how we apply these uh, to what we just learned about the machine. We want to look about how we're going to uh, apply these self-supporting angles, how we're going to apply some fine detail, and then fine clearance, uh, part clearance, because we do uh, assemblies and mating parts, things like that. So looking at the self-supporting angle, we already know, you know that we can get away with a, a 45 degree angle without supports. So how do we incorporate that into our design? Here's a part that is a, one of my customer's parts, and it is a um, robotic pickup tube. And basically, it's just going to have some vacuum lines, electrical lines going through these square um, ho uh, holes in here. So if you look at this part on the left, this is tr the traditional design of it. This is how you would design it and build it in a, um, uh, a regular traditional style. However, if you think about 3D printing and how you can build on an angle with less support, just rotating that at 45 degrees gives you some interesting results. And here's the part that's been built just to show you. You can see that we're going to have less support supports where it's rotated at 45 degrees. We're going to use a lot less material, a lot less labor cost to clean it up because I can just snap these off, whereas the other ones I'm going to have to soak off, break off, do a lot of labor time. And I'm going to have a faster build time. We'll get into why you have faster build time. But basically your faster build time is because now your head is not having to switch between support and part back and forth. Once I get past my support on the right, I can just keep building part all the way up, and it saves uh, some time. And we're going to see an example of that later. So once we incorporate the self-supporting, let's look at some fine detail and lettering, because I know that you guys do a, a lot of lettering and text on your parts out there. So FDM, you're limited by your road width again, whereas Polyjet, 1600 DPI. For your fine detail lettering, SOLIDWORKS out there, most of your CAD package will use any true type font that's installed in your Windows font folder. SOLIDWORKS, uh, starting in 2014, I believe, had this um, uh, stick font, they call it, and it works well also. Now, there's a difference between serif and sans serif fonts. Um, for those of you that aren't printers, uh, serif is that little tick mark that you see on the ends of the E or the top and bottom of the letter I. Those are serifs. Um, and a sans serif, sans is Latin for without. I know, I, when I, I'm so old that when I took Latin, it was not a dead language. But sans is for without that serif. So aerial fonts, things like that. This sans serif, without the serif, is better for 3D printing because you're not having that small little tick mark to draw. You also want to avoid script and calligraphy. Again, they have those, uh, they don't have a consistent uh, path or dimension that they hold because they're very curvy. Comic sans works well. Aerial fonts are always good. So even the uh, a script-looking comic sans, because it is a consistent uh, width of the letters, that works well. And if you have questions on your width of your letters, don't forget that in SOLIDWORKS there is a measure tool that you can actually go in and measure your lettering and see uh, how big it is in there. So remember with lettering we have, uh, you can have engraved or embossed text. And I recommend about 20 thousandths of uh, thickness. So if you're going to uh, put that embossed text in there, you want to have it minimum of 20 thousandths. Personally, I prefer the uh, embossed text rather than the raised text. And the reason is uh, two reasons. One, if you have the embossed text, you're drawing all the material around it, so you've got lots of space. If you're drawing the um, I'm sorry, the engraved text. If you're drawing the engraved text, you have lots of material around it. If you're drawing the embossed text, you are now limited to how wide that is that you have to draw that letter. 
uh, T, for example, there, you're going to only be 0.5 millimeters uh, wide, whereas you don't care as much when it's engraved. Now, the other reason I like engraved uh, better is because it is embedded into the part. If I want to put a part number on a, uh, a part and I want to, and it's raised, or if I, um, I want to put my name on there or my company logo, it's too easy for someone to come along and just sand that off or chip it off. So if it's a fixture or something like that, I prefer the engraved text on there. Again, 20, at least 20 thousandths deep. So your orientation for, for your text, uh, your best practice is always going to be uh, FDM will be facing up is always the best. The sidewall is good if it's not too deep. My rule of thumb is as long as my sidewall does not uh, go deeper than my road width, then I can get away with no support. For example, if I'm drawing a road width of 20 thousandths for a 10 thousandths layer, and I don't go deeper than 20 thousandths on my text, then I don't really need support in my text, and I can get away without it. Um, your your uh, polyjet, if you're doing a gloss finish, Always facing up on your text is the best, but if you're doing a matte finish on PolyJet, any surface will work. And the reason is, on a matte finish, you're putting support material all around your part so that it'll have an even finish. On your gloss finish, you're not putting support around the outside edges unless you had text or something hanging out there. Then you'd have to have it, and it's going to leave a little uh, uh, surface finish on there on the side and not be as glossy as it would be facing up. So try to position your parts facing up. OK, part clearance. Just a quick word about part clearance. We do a lot of assemblies in CAD. And you can even print your assemblies on your 3D printing. But you've got to make sure that your spacing in between, uh, it's crucial because it determines the flexibility and the bendability of your design. Here you can see that if you're doing a chain mail, for example, I've got a minimum of uh, 15 uh, thousandths clearance in there. And that's just so we can get, uh, it's going to build with supports. And I want to be able to wash the supports out. So about 15 thousandths at least to be able to get some uh, support material out of there. So we want to look at exporting data and understanding the STL format. Almost all 3D uh, machines, or all of them, I should say, accept an STL format. We want to talk about how to save that STL format in SOLIDWORKS and how using shells make a difference in your exported data. So this is an interesting subject. A lot of people uh, are confused with STL. In the CAD world out there, it's controlled mathematically by complex algorithms. The STL format is simply a mesh or a net of triangles that cover only the surface. And it has no parametric value. It's just laying a, a net around your part. STL, I should mention, stands for Surface Tessellated Language or Standard Tessellated Language. A lot of people think it stands for stereolithography. I will admit stereolithography was the first technology to use the STL format for 3D printing, but they were the first 3D printing technology also. But it's, it is surface tessellation because it is triangles being tessellated on the surface. So sometimes you get STL errors. The translators have gotten much better over the years. But uh, when you're converting your CAD, you'll see some errors uh, in your STL. It'll be overlapping triangles, missing triangles. Things like that uh, that can be uh, have to be edited or improved before you print. SolidWorks makes an excellent uh, converter for their CAD to STL, and uh, I recommend it. It's very good. There are third-party softwares available out there to modify STL. I will say that not all CAD translators are created equal. Uh, SolidWorks goes out 16 decimal places for accuracy. Now, there are some 3D printers out there that tout that they can take the CAD data straight into their printer. And yes, they can. 
but they have a CAD translator in the background that is translating it to an STL and slicing it. So the question becomes, do you want, do you want to have control of creating that STL, or do you want to have the software or the machine have control of it? And here's what we mean by having control. You can see your STL resolution here. First of all, your CAD requirements is a three-dimensional model. It's got to be a watertight volume. If you're doing surfaces in CATIA, uh, software like that, you can make STLs from that surface, but you cannot print them because they're not a closed volume. It doesn't matter if you're working in inches or millimeters. Uh, your CAD surface is going to be approximated by polygons. And you can see the two examples here, uh, the orange one, you can see how large the triangles are. And when you build that part, you're going to see that surface texture on that part, whereas the part on the right, the blue part, you will see that it is much finer detail. And you can control that. You can control the triangles. The triangles are all defined in 3D coordinate space. And if you were to look at the triangles, you've got three vertexes there, and every triangle has a surface. It has a face called the facet normal. So the normal should always be facing out. Should you have an inverted triangle, very rare in SOLIDWORKS, almost never, uh, should you ever have that, it would be ignored. And for some reason, that triangle or that surface would not be printed in your 3D printer. But you would know it would give you an error in your software. You can save your STL in two formats, the ASCII format, and that's the American Standard Code that, that really uh, in, uh, is an older code, or you can say, save it in binary. Binary is that base numeral, two numeral system, and it uses ones and zeros. The old joke is there's 10 kinds of people in the world, those who know binary and those who don't. Zero, one, one, zero. OK, 10 people. Um, the file size is about six times smaller than ASCII. So for this reason, we always want to use our binary as a default. Now, you can open an STL file uh, and read it in ASCII. It's very interesting. You can open it up in Notepad. For example, here's a one millimeter cube that, uh, that was designed. Notice it's got 12 triangles. That's all it takes to make a cube. And that each one is defined uh, in space with the vertex out there, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1. And that is telling it in space where that triangle points are. Also notice it does show the facet is facing outward there. So know that there nowhere in this data is recorded the color of the material, and nowhere is recorded any kind of a um, uh, parametric value or relationship. For this reason, sometimes I call the STL file a stupid triangle language, because it does not remember color. It does not remember the uh, parametric values. It's just the surface triangles. One thing that's interesting on the STL format is that you can check and make sure that you have a good file just by looking at the file size. If you know that the STL file is always 80 bytes for a header, 4 bytes for the number of triangles, and 50 bytes will define each triangle, therefore you'll know that every correct STL file will always end in 84 or 34, usually 84 because it'll be even numbered. But you can see this in up there, well, when you're saving the file in SOLIDWORKS, it says my file size is 185, 984. So it ends up in 34 or 84. That's a clue that you've got a good file. If it's not that, then you're missing a surface. Something's not translating correctly. Just a quick file check uh, that you can do. So now let's talk about saving the STL file in SOLIDWORKS. This really is important for the quality of your part that you build. In SOLIDWORKS, it's File, Save As. And then a lot of people don't recognize that when you do the Save As and you pull down STL and your Save As type, that you get an option down there. There's a little button that says Options. Most people ignore it and just keep going. If you ignore it, you're just going to get a standard output. 
Uh, however, if you hit that Options button, you have some choices in here. You can tell it to save in binary. You can tell it to save in ASCII. You'll always want to use binary. You can tell it to save in inches, millimeters, centimeters, whatever you're working in. And then you've got some resolution choices here. You've got a choice of coarse, fine, custom. We're going to go over each one of those. And when you hit custom, you're going to be able to define your deviation and your angle to get a much better file. Your deviation of your triangle is how close your triangle edge is approximating your CAD edge. So know that you're, you're going to have a chord length across your radius, for example, is what we're showing there. And that deviation, if it's set to two thousandths, will be two thousandths of an inch there. Your angle is also going to control how, if you allow it to go three degrees, one degree, whatever in there, you can make tighten up that angle. So if you're doing a, a radius or it's going to have a draft angle on there, you can have a really clean looking surface going across there and it won't be a, a polygon across there. So just notice on here that you have that tolerance in there. My personal preference is I will use a tolerance of two to four thousandths in there. It really doesn't do any good to get much less than that. And then on your uh, angle, I'll use anywhere between 1 and 3 degrees in there. So there's some idea on how those deviation and angle works to your CAD edge. Now one thing I want you to make sure is that you're not confused by looking at image quality. There is an image setting in SOLIDWORKS and it looks very similar. Changing your image setting for your graphics does not change your STL resolution. You can make this just as fine and high as you want it, and it's just going to slow you down in SOLIDWORKS, and it's not going to make a better STL file just because it looks better on the screen. So don't think that the image quality setting is the, they look similar. They are not the same thing. So let's look at a sample part here and look at some of those settings that we can use. If you those of you who have taken the Essentials class in SOLIDWORKS, you will recognize this part. So we have three choices, coarse, fine, and custom. So if you choose the coarse on here, there's what your setting will be. Here again, you'll see it ends in 84 on there, but you've got only 1,262 triangles. So you've got a small amount of triangles. Uh, you can actually count the triangles in the, on the edge or in the corner down down in front and see that there's 10 triangles uh, going across there. Therefore, it's going to be pretty coarse in there. Now, if you said, I want fine, the fine option, you can see again, you can, you've got a few more triangles. Again, I ended in 84, but I've tripled the, almost the number of triangles I've got in here. Here again, instead of 10, though, in my corner, I've got about 18 triangles. They're easy to count up. If I were to go and set my fine setting to where I have a 2,000th uh, chord edge there and a 1,000th, I think it was set, on my angle control, you can see I have quite a few more triangles uh, in here defining that. That is going to give me a much better surface when I print it. We, I recommend the custom setting always. For your STL, once you set it, it generally defaults back to that on your SOLIDWORKS from now on, but you could go back in and check on it. But you'll get much more definition, a rounder, smoother part, and it won't be polygonized. My rule of thumb is when I look at that corner down there and I say, oh, can I count the triangles? One, two, three, four, you know, five, six, seven. If I got ten triangles, I can count them. I'm not going to be happy with that printed part. However, when I look at this one, I count them one, two, three, four. I go, it's not. I don't have the time or the patience to count all that. That's going to make a good part for me. So when you start comparing these, you'll see your core setting, much smaller file size. You'll see your fine, larger file size, and they're not linear. They're exponential on file size. If you notice, so when I do a custom city set, setting, I get a much larger file size but I get a lot more triangles and I'll have a better output for my printed part. 
So using shells and your uh, exporting data here for your for your SolidWorks, a shell in 3D printing is defined as a closed model. I know in SolidWorks a shell is defined as hollowing out your model. So in SolidWorks I use we would say that it's a solid body, but in 3D printing world they call that a shell. Every 3D printed object must have at least one shell, and that's just a closed model. Uh, volume. Multiple hearts can be created as an assembly as long as they're not overlapping. Sometimes you'll want to create multiple um, multiple shells in a part uh, because you want to get, assign a different color or you might want to assign a different durometer, make one harder than the other. The polyjet technology allows you to do that. So you have a couple of settings in the uh, SolidWorks. So you'll see down here uh, on the screen, this is that same options screen where I had the course Fine and Custom. You'll see that it says Save All Components as an Assembly in a Single File. Now if I do that, I'm going to have one file. Now I may have 10 shells, but I'll have one file in there. Uh, or you can uncheck that box, and you're going to end up with multiple STL files. For example, this particular part that I'm looking at, this is a gear, a uh, ring of gears. Uh, there's 10 shells in this part. By unchecking it, I'm going to end up with one shell for each of those or 10 STL files. If I left my box checked as one STL file, then I would end up with one STL file and then I'd have 10 shells in there for it. So depending on what you want to do, do by, make, by unchecking the box and say make each one its own file, I could assign a different color to each of those gears basically in a polyjet technology. So one thing that you do want to be aware of, that of overlapping triangles. If you're going to create your parts like the one on the left and you have an overlapping shell, that's going to give you intersecting triangles in there, and it's going to be a problem. You want one file with one shell for your FDM application, especially right here, as shown on the right. This is a cross-sectional view. Because if you had it with an intersecting shell, this is what you're going to get when you print it out. It's going to think that that inside pin going into the block is going to be a hole in there a solid bottom, you're going to have a solid top, but it will be hollow all the way through that slice in there. Therefore, that pin on top is going to break off very easily. The only time you really see an error like this is in some primitive uh, CAD like Google SketchUp, things like that. And I point that out because we all have kids that come up, hey, Dad, I made this in Google SketchUp. Can you print it for me? And I'm like, great, now i got to fix it. But anyway, uh, this is what you're going to see uh, in a primitive a CAD thing like that. So just be aware of it, that it does exist when you start building your part. Now, you can make your block with a hole in it and make a pin where it slides in and out and make it a separate feature so that in PolyJet here, I could actually have two shells and I could make one a different color or I could make it a different hardness uh, on there because PolyJet lets me blend materials together. Last thing we want to look at is our part printing here. We want to build the best quality, and so I want to talk about part orientation, and I want to talk about build times and how you can look at that. So part orientation is the first thing. We know that we can build on a 45 degree angle, so be aware that just like uh, stair steps, uh, a lot of people, when you're building a part that's got a contour on it, it can have what, we, what looks like wood grain, but it's really stair steps. And just like when you're building steps, you have a rise and a run. And when your run exceeds your rise and they're not equal, that's where you're going to see a problem. So as you deviate further than 45 degrees, you're going to see a problem with stair stepping on your surface. And here's a good example. This is the same part. It's a mouse. I built these at 13,000 layers, which is as coarse as we can build. But there's a huge difference 
between the one on the left laying down, there's going to be a lot of stair steps in there because my run is so much more than my rides because it's a, such a steep angle, slide angle. And then on the left, I get a little, uh, the next one in the center, I get a little bit better. And then on the right, standing up, that is my best quality that I can get because now my uh, contour is standing up. I get a much better uh, shape in there. It takes long. It could take longer to build. It will take longer to build, but I don't have to spend any time sanding on this part, and it makes a huge difference. So build orientation can be a big thing, and we'll talk a little bit more about it. So I'll talk a little bit about build times in there, and build orientation does affect your build time. So the orientation does matter. So on these parts, you have to think about which one, the same part, which one's going to build faster here in FDM. Is it going to be the one on the left, the yellow one, or the blue one? Well, we do tips and tricks in SolidWorks on our daily blog on our CATI website, and here you can read about this on this blog. I'm going to give you the answer, but I just want to put a plug in that you can look on our website and look at our daily blogs, and we talk about 3D printing, SolidWorks, and it's every day, so you can subscribe to that. But if you actually built this in uh, FDM technology, it would be almost an hour longer to build it laying down than standing up. And you say, well, that's odd because most 3D printers, typically you want to lay stuff down to the shortest Z height. What you're looking at here is that it's going to require supports to support that overhang uh, coming out. It's going to require supports inside those slotted uh, holes there. And those supports, you're switching your head back and forth between uh, each layer to draw each one as it goes layer by layer. Whereas on the right, I'm building my support on my base, and from that point on, I can build it out without changing uh, my head, and therefore my head is only drawing one material, and therefore I can build much faster. So be aware that in some technologies, some geometries and technologies, you're going to be able to build faster standing up. That's why it's important to understand your machine capabilities. Now let's look at multiple build times. Here again is our sample part, and I'm going to look at the times for building a single part and building a multiple part. Polyjet, our, you can see that our Object 30 Pro, it takes much longer to build this one part than it would on a 260, 350, or the 500. The, the 30 has one print head, where the 260, 350, 500 have multiple print heads, so they will build the part faster. They also have some faster um, uh, speeds on the uh, servo motors. Now, on your FDM, we have a, a SE Plus. We have the Stratus. That's our newest, uh, one of our newest models. The F370, the 450 is our larger machine. Here, they run about the same. The 370 has incorporated the servo mo motors that were on our 450, so they run pretty much the same. The 900, a little bit slower to build, but that's because it's a very large machine, 36 by 24 by 36. It has a lot more travel to travel around layer to layer. So for that reason, it's a little bit slower. But you can see the, the hours here and here, probably about five hours in here to build it on the FDM. When you look at multiple uh, part building, this is, uh, you're looking, I took the Forest 450, the Object 500, they're about the same uh, size machines out there. You'll see that the FDM is very linear. What it costs you to build one part, you can double it for two, triple it for three, and so on. However, on the uh, Object, the uh, uh, Polyjet technology, you're going to see that for one part to build three parts is a slight increase, and then it jumps up for four, five, and six, and then it jumps up again. That is because the object machine, the printer head, will go across and build three parts all in a row, but because the build platform is larger, if I want to build a second row, a fourth part, I actually have to index the print head down. So once I index that print head, it doesn't take much time to just ink check the print head out all the way across, and six parts cost just about the same amount of time as four parts would take. So for that reason, the polyjet is not a linear. And as you build multiple parts, it could be the same part, it can be different parts. You get a little gain out of the polyjet by building multiple parts on it. 
that pretty much covers everything because we can only cover the basics today in, an, in a short period of time, but this will get you started on your journey to 3D printing. And I would like to mention we have upcoming webinars, and if I see, if we have time for any questions, I'll let you let me know, uh, Chris, if we got anything here that I can answer. Very, very informative. Uh, I haven't seen any questions come through yet, but I now know why my 3D prints from SolidWorks did not work well. <laughs> <laughs> Learned a ton. Okay. Uh, for for those of you that are uh, that are with us once again, this webcast is recorded. It will be uploaded to that YouTube channel. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you very much for uh, the presentation, Mark. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you to everyone that attended.